Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth session in American English Live Teacher Development Series 4. My name is Lauren, and I'll be with you today, along with my colleague behind the scenes, moderator Amy, who will be serving as moderators to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. Today, our host Kate will be talking with our presenter, Spencer Lamayich, about how providing opportunities for creativity and personal expression during grammar instruction can have a positive effect on language learning and student motivation. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, welcome. As Lauren said, I'm Kate and I'm part of the American English social media team. I'm happy to be your facilitator and host today. We'd like to extend a warm welcome as always to our first time viewers and we'd like to welcome back all of you who have been with us for several sessions. Please let us know how many times you have viewed one of our webinars. We'd love to hear from you. Let's start with these great photos featuring teachers from Maharagama, Sri Lanka, and Sucre, Bolivia, who participated in past American English live events. We love to see teachers learning and sharing ideas, so please share your photos by emailing them to AmericanEnglishWebinars at elprograms.org. It's there on your screen or by sharing them on social media. If you share them on social media, be sure to tag us at American English for Educators so we can see the great photos you post. We may feature one of your photos in the next session. As you know, our topics for this series are increasing learner motivation, content-based instruction, and communicative grammar teaching. Today is our fifth session in series four. After today, we only have one session remaining and we hope that you'll join us. Which topic have you enjoyed the most so far? Share your ideas in the comments or chat. Speaking of the last session in this series, daylight savings time begins in the United States on March 10th. This means that on that day, we set our clocks forward one hour. So the final session, American English Live 4.6, will take place at 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time in Washington, D.C. You might find that the webinar is, a diff is um, scheduled at a different time in your region, maybe one hour later in your local time zone. So please be sure to check that um, conversion link that we've provided here on this slide. Um, and be sure to enter the session date March 20th when using the converter. This information is also on the Ning, AmericanEnglishWebinars.com, and in the announcement section. Uh, we don't want you to miss our final session, so make sure to check your clocks for that important change. So here's a little bit about what to expect during today's session. Each session is approximately 60 minutes long and is often related to an American English eTeacher Massive Open Online course or a Teacher's Corner theme on the American English website. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments too, but we really hope to hear from you, our audience, um, so that we can address your ideas, questions, experiences, and comments. Please do share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. When our session comes to a close in about an hour, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the session, we'll share a link in the comments and at the top of this post. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three questions correctly once you've successfully passed the quiz, you can expect to get your badge by email from badger at badger.io in about a week. And now for today's session, Effective Grammar Teaching, Balancing Input and Output. This presentation will help you enrich classroom time by examining how to incorporate the practice of real language into grammar lessons. The session will consider what real communication means and examine the motivating impact that creativity and opportunities for personal expression have on successful language learning. Participants will work with sample lesson plans and communicative activities that balance language input and output. The activity ideas and practical steps outlined in this session are applicable for classes of any age, ability level, or level of access to technology. 
And now it's my ple pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Spencer Lemayage. Spencer works as an English for academic purposes and exam preparation instructor and teacher trainer. And he was previously director of studies at a private language school. He recently served two years as a US Department of State English Language Fellow, teaching linguistics and TEFL methodology courses. Spencer has spoken frequently on ELT methodology, second language acquisition, and culture instruction in classroom teaching. He's a strong advocate for engaging students through critical and creative thinking and through the use of learners' mother tongue in language instruction. He has a master's in TESOL degree from Biola University. Welcome, Spencer. We're, we're so happy to have you here today. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for that introduction and welcome to this AE Live uh, 4.5. I'm Spencer and I'm very happy to engage with you today in this uh, interactive professional development session. One of the reasons why I really enjoy teaching English is because you get to engage with students as individuals. And there's such a variety of topics that you always get something different from every student. No two students are alike and they always have unique ideas and ways of expressing themselves. Today, that's part of what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the importance of having a balanced class that supports learners by giving them the opportunity they need to use language and express themselves. Let's look at a rundown of today's topics. First, we'll talk about the importance of having balance, balance between input and output, and the role that plays in communicative teaching. Then we'll talk about how that balance can be achieved in a lesson plan. And finally, we'll look at some more activity ideas for how we can get students that all important output and support them to express themselves creatively. As we get started here, I'd like to ask the participants a question. First, we'll show them uh, two pictures on the upcoming two slides. These are pictures of two different classrooms. I want the participants to consider elements of effective grammar teaching. What does it look like in practice? Let's go ahead and look at these two classrooms. Which classroom do you think would be more effective? Great, we're look, gonna be looking at classroom A and classroom B, and if we could look at them sort of back and forth a little bit. Um, and as you're looking at these, think about which classroom would be more effective for grammar teaching, and please let us know why you feel that way as well. Which classroom is more effective for, class, uh, for grammar teaching and why? We'd love to hear your reasons why as well. Looks like a lot of Something. people are putting uh, classroom B. We're getting all sorts of answers for classroom B. Ann Van Lee, Bina Korala, Zahir Abbas. Um, why do you think so, everyone? Let's see, Tayyab says it's an interactive session. The students are more engaged. There's more interaction. They're discussing and communicating with others. Let's see what else. It's more, a lot of people are saying it's more engaging. It allows for interaction. There's more communication. Great responses. What do you think, Spencer? Great. It's definitely uh, the same thing I have in mind. <laughs> um, the, the, when we think about what the teacher is doing and what the students are doing, and we look at the first classroom, it's more of a lecture style. Uh, the second is more interactive, as many people have pointed out. So is one of those necessarily better for studying grammar? I would say, of course, as most of the participants said, that we advocate for the communicative side. Um, the, the trouble with a lecture style, um, and many, many times the classroom is not in such a big room as we saw in that first picture, a small room can still use a lecture style. The trouble with the lecture style is that it's just the teacher transmitting information to the students and um, they're trying to get their idea across to those students. But it doesn't mean that the students will internalize what the teacher is saying. So this is our first point here is that 
input alone will not produce fluency, especially in those productive skills. If students have, if we want students to be able to speak and we want students to be able to produce English, they need that opportunity for output. We focus on communicative classroom a lot and a, a quick definition of that would be learning by sharing and using language rather than simply being told about it. H.D. Brown, the author of uh, some textbooks on teaching English as a foreign language, has an interesting insight about this in his book, Principles of Learning and Teaching. His insight here is that teaching doesn't always cause learning. If you think of teaching as what the teacher does to transmit an idea, and learning as the time when students uh, receive an idea, internalize it, and take it home. So we have, as teachers, have to change our perspective from teaching as a transmission of knowledge or teaching about language to teaching as facilitating learners' acquisition of knowledge. And that happens by students practicing using the language. <laughs> Wonderful. We have a lot of people in our audience today who are agreeing with you, and I just want to share a couple of comments. So Nazia Mohammed says, in classroom B, there is direct interaction between the teacher and the students. And in classroom A, the lecture method is being used and, and the teacher just has to speak and the students are sort of passive. So I think she's sort of echoing some of the things that you're saying. And then Nayan Kumar says, um, Classroom B looks more informal and hence learning happens. Students like that informal approach and feeling more comfortable in the classroom. So great comments. Great comments. Um, I would say with that informal bit, the, the reason why that's so powerful is because it, people let down their guard so that they call it the affective filter where you resist you know, speaking up and trying to take a risk and interact. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone, for your comments. Keep them coming. One of the things that we want to get across with this presentation is this idea of balance in input and output. So this is kind of a framework that's originally meant for a course, but it could also apply to a lesson. And it's a framework suggested by ISP Nation and John McAllister in their excellent book, Language Curriculum Design. They talk about how we need a balance between these four aspects, meaning focused input, language focused learning, meaning focused output, and fluency activities. So it's worth pointing out that a lot of grammar classrooms focus too heavily on that second part, language focus. But uh, we want it to be a combination of all these things so that we can achieve a balance. We're going to come back to this idea of a framework a few times during this presentation. I'd like to ask the participants another question. Uh, this question is from a joke, although not everyone is going to think that it's a funny joke. This is an old joke from a language classroom. Um, and it starts with a teacher and a student. The teacher says, give me a sentence that starts with I. Maybe they are talking to their class and, and one of braver students speaks up. The student says, I is, and the teacher cuts him off. Oh, don't, uh, don't start with I is. You should never say I is. You should always say I am. Now try again. What did you want to say? The student is a bit ashamed, but speaks up again and says, I am the ninth letter of the alphabet. Oops. <laughs> apologizing because the student thinks he made a mistake, right? But they actually so, did want to say I, the letter I, is the ninth letter of the alphabet. Right. Mm -hmm. Teacher didn't even see that one coming. <laughs> what is the mistake there? That's what we want to hear from our participants. What mistake did the teacher make? Great. What mistake did the teacher make? What should this teacher have done um, instead of what they did do? Let's see. Lots of great responses already. Tayeb says the teacher has to listen first. 
Um, XO says their context. They didn't wait for the context. Um, let's see. Helen T says that the teacher overreacted. And Norma also says this, the teacher did not hear the student first. Viorkia uh, says the teacher should have listened until the end of the student's sentence. Great responses. What do you think, Spencer? Great responses. Mm -hmm. It's great to hear the way that people say it uh, with such different expressions. Everyone has their own way of saying it. Mm -hmm. um, my thought here is just in line with what everyone says. This is a grammar classroom out of balance. So we're talking about the idea of balancing input and output. In this case, the teacher is giving input about what language is appropriate, which structures are appropriate, but the input is not appropriate. So the classroom is already out of balance. The main issue here is there's too much focus on language forms. The teacher didn't give the student a chance to really say what they're trying to say. Of course, in this joke, it kind of seems trivial. I mean, there's no emotional significance of a student saying the letter I is the ninth letter of the alphabet. But sometimes if a teacher doesn't listen to their student and give them an opportunity to share something, it could have a more uh, significant impact on the relationship students have in the class or something like that. What if a student shared something more personal like, I don't feel I can make friends well. The teacher is in a unique uh, place to interact with that student about what, what they're sharing. Definitely. Yeah, we have another couple good comments here from JP says that most of the time in a typical classroom, the teacher has mental models and expects to hear what's on his or her mind rather than waiting for what the student would say. That's a really good point. Um, let's see. And to what you just said, Spencer, the, Theophil said, um, interrupting the students in such a way is intimidating and therefore might inhibit the student's effort to try out a new language. Really great points, everyone. Um, what excellent comments. Thanks so much and keep them coming. Keep going. <laughs> it's great to hear what everyone has to say. Um, and I think it, it fits in with what I'm trying to say, which is that even if someone is leading a presentation or leading a discussion, we want to hear what everyone says. Um, this is one of the main points that we're trying to get from this presentation is um, a point that I hope listeners will take away. <clears throat> Teachers need to include activities that allow students to express themselves creatively. Most of the time this happens through some kind of personalization. I just want to say really quick, I saw a comment of somebody said, we have more than 50 students in a class. And definitely there's a different set of challenges in listening honestly to a student uh, when you have a larger class. But I think what we're talking about here is just the perspective of, do we want our students to have a voice, have an opportunity to share personally about themselves? And this is part, a large part of the output that helps to balance a grammar lesson is uh, students get to share uh, about themselves. They're an individual and they've got their own things to say. Uh, this is real communication. What is real communication? Real communication is when a student shares something that no one else knows. What can a student share that no one else knows? Well, they can share about themselves because nobody else knows them exactly as they know themselves. So if we believe that English or any kind of language learners learn by interaction and communicating, what a great opportunity we have if we let students personalize the material and express themselves. Absolutely. Let's go to our third uh, question here for participants. This question comes from a story. I was teaching um, at the university in Borneo uh, a few years ago, and I taught a group of um, lecturers from different faculties at the university. It was a general English class, and we enjoyed our time, and we did some grammar lessons. But then they told me, teacher, 
We've studied these same grammar lessons year after year, but we still have trouble with them and we still make mistakes using them. So the question for our participants is, why? What might explain this situation that these students are in? Great question. So maybe that's true for some of your students. Maybe they've studied the same grammar year after year and they're still not able to use it correctly. Um, so why, what, what might explain this? We'd love to hear from you. Let's see, um, maybe there's no context um, from one person. Maybe they are not given the grammar in the context of meaningful language. John Chi says not, maybe not enough practice. A lot of people are saying inadequate practice. Um, Adnan says maybe the teaching is too traditional. Um, let's see. Um, maybe the teacher is focusing on the rules too much from Vivo. Um, not enough output. Shola says maybe the class isn't fun. That's actually a great point. <laughs> so they're not really engaged with it. Um, Hiralel says they learned grammar, but they didn't learn it in context. Um, wonderful responses, everybody. Great, great. Keep your comments coming. Thank you. It's great to hear. I, I want to pick up on a few of those points. The point about uh, context definitely ties in with this presentation a lot, as well as the point about practice. So, so the point that I'm making most from this story is they had a lack of communicative skills practice. They might have these ideas about what grammar is or what grammar structures uh, work, but they never got to use it. And I think someone said something about no language environment. Um, which sometimes the language environment happens outside of class. Students get this extensive practice. They have um, contacts who speak this language and they get to uh, practice this language, uh, you know, on their own time. But I would argue that this kind of um, skills practice has to start in class. Um, and that's much of what we're trying to say here is that after students get some language, they need to use it personally and to communicate and interact with their friends. And that's, uh, again, real communication. Let's uh, recap what we've discussed so far here. Again, we wanna to touch on this idea of balance, the importance of balance. Our first point was from the lecture class, input alone is not enough. Students need to be able to communicate. Our second point was about the teacher who cut off her student from the joke. And the point there is that students have to be able to express themselves, whether doing this output, it needs to be personal and have meaning and, and they can be creative. And the third point is that uh, we want students to get this kind of skills practice, speaking, interacting, sharing ideas that starts in the grammar class. Not grammar on its own, but combined with these uh, skills. Wonderful. Thanks so much for this great recap. That really helps to make all of those points clear from our great discussion um, at the beginning of this webinar. Thanks. Well, we're moving along through this uh, presentation and we've talked a bit about the importance of balancing input and output. So we wanna look at how can we put that into a lesson? It's all great to have this theory of input and output, but how does it really work? So uh, the easy way to think about balancing input and output is to kind of break the lesson up into these different parts. These different parts, I put it as three parts, just to, just to uh, have a different way to think about it. It's on the next slide here. These three parts are entering a topic or exploring that topic. A lot of people from our participants talked about this in terms of providing a context. So that's what I mean by entering a topic. Instead of just jumping straight to talk about the grammar structures, 
we have some reason to talk about them because there's a situation that would use them. Then we do need a time to focus on the language itself to explain the way the rules work. It could be teacher led or it could be student led, this part of the lesson. And then on to the output part where um, students respond to that topic, they personalize it, they get to be creative, interact with others. So these are actually just different words, different, this is a different wording of the framework we looked at before. Let's consider a lesson then. <clears throat> the first lesson that I'm imagining is a lesson for lower level class and the teacher is teaching about there is and there are. There is for singular, describing objects in a room, let's say is the topic. There is for singular things and there are for plural. So maybe the lesson begins with some brainstorming. Brainstorming of vocabulary, things in a room, things in a house. It might even start more simply than that. It might be, uh, where do you live? How many rooms? Do you live in a house or an apartment? Is it similar to the, the place where other people live? Great, and this is the part, this is step one. This is exploring the topic. Right. So um, at that point, I'm saying we're thinking about what vocabulary the students can use later on when they get to practicing there is and there are. So maybe we're showing them some pictures. Maybe we've got like this picture of a living room here and they're thinking about the items in the room, a table, a sofa, pillows, a lamp. Um, or they might be making a list comparing with their friend. What's in your living room? What's in your house? After they've sort of thought about the topic a bit, the teacher can can model the language and provide a sample of what it is. There is a sofa. There are two green pillows on the sofa. And the teacher's probably writing it on the board or in some other way, giving it to the students that they can look at it. So this is the part yes. where they're focusing on the language, number two. Exactly so, mm -hmm. right. And then, um, that's the input. So we had topical input and language based input, and then it goes to output. So maybe the students will describe their own house or their own room, but this time they're using the language. At first, when they're exploring the topic, they're just using any way that's possible to communicate. Sofa, yes, sofa, right? But now that they've talked about there is and there are, they're using that to describe their own reality. Great, oh. and this is the part where they respond and develop the topic. Right, mm -hmm. or as I put it on this slide, it's number three, personalize this topic of, of furniture and items in a house by describing their own house. Great. And then th what I'm imagining for this lesson, although there's lots of options, of course, is that, um, <clears throat> The students would write a description and then put it up, the teacher would put it up on the wall and other students could move around, read that description and think about whose house or whose uh, living area they're reading about. They might even ask someone, oh, this house has a hammock. This house has some very unusual furniture. And then they, they go around and ask their friends, uh, their classmates, whose that is, they try to find the author. It's just a different level of interacting about what the students have shared, personalizing their topic. Great, and we have a great comment from Ronelia Sagana. She says, personalizing is great as students can definitely relate and give their ideas and insights. Thanks for the comment. So, just to flesh out that last part of the lesson a bit more, maybe some of our participants have heard of this idea before of a gallery walk is a way. It's like if you imagine you're at an art gallery and people are walking around looking at the pictures, 
but in this case they're not looking at um, painted art they're looking at word art or what the students have written their written work goes up on the wall so great Janet says um, this goes beyond just um, presenting or a PowerPoint it's about contextualizing the language activating their prior knowledge and involving the students also a great comment that shows that um, yeah a lot of people are really agreeing with your um, suggestions today thanks for the comments uh, I, I just want to share one extra idea about this gallery walk thing so mm -hmm. we had that comment before about um, a class with 50 students um, there's other you might have a large class or you might have other reasons why um, a gallery walk like this is difficult. Maybe the way the room is set up or there's not space to move around or something like that. Um, but students can still interact through their written work um, using technology. If you have that kind of technology available, it could be on a phone or through a computer uh, in a lab. Um, Great, so there are many ways to sort of differentiate this gallery walk idea for your context and depending on how many students you have, the technology you have, that kind of thing. Right. Great. Let's uh, sort of recap this lesson here. I want to refer to this lesson, um, sorry, uh, on the next slide. I want to refer to the, the framework that we've been using here. So meaning-focused input, language-focused learning. In this lesson, the meaning-focused input, we kind of already said it as we're describing the lesson, is about um, exploring the items in the house, right? Mm -hmm. the exploring the vocabulary and describing a house. The language-focused learning, as you pointed out, is the focus on there is and there are the meaning focus output is when students write about their own house or a room in their house and then the fluency is when they move around and uh, read what other people have written and perhaps discuss to find the author of something they've written sounds great one other quick comment I'll mention um, Jose Gregorio says I always try to make students personalize the topic I prefer that they relate their prior knowledge and background to grammar use by applying rules to their environment. So great, great idea and thanks for sharing. And I think he's just sharing how much he agrees with all the wonderful ideas you're sharing with us today, Spencer. So thank you. I feel like I want to join his class. <laughs> I think I've got a picture here of, of what I, I wanted to share for the idea about um a gallery walk that happens in an online space so this is just to flesh out the idea a bit is it could happen in a google document it could happen in different kind of collaborative space or website this is an example here is uh from padlet and this is a screenshot of something that my class produced a few months ago um, the students were exploring a topic and the topic was about personal achievement, individuals they admired, and personal goals they had for their lives in the future. Some of the language that we'd focused on in that unit was about present perfect for experience and achievements and past simple for things that had happened in their life. So we went into the computer room which we had available to us and the students uh, were able to type out their answers. Sorry, I'm still on the uh, Padlet there. The, the students were able to type out their answers and um, share their ideas and read instantly what their classmates were writing about because it's like this uh, real-time interaction. Anyways, great. just wanted yeah, to share so that. A, yeah, that's a variation on the gallery walk place. We do have a question about the gallery walk from Areen. Um, how can we do the gallery walk in the class where the chairs are fixed and the devices cannot be found except for the board and uh, markers and chairs? 
Well, there's a few uh, strategies you could try, but um, basically you want paper to be moving in front of people's eyes. So if there's a space outside the room where students could uh, walk around in the hall, that might work, or you could just try passing papers around um, but you'd have to keep them moving at a certain speed. So tell people that they might not read the whole description. You're just going to give them a certain amount of time. Otherwise, it wouldn't be fair. Uh, the paper might get stopped up at someone. Yeah, great ideas. Yeah, it's all about adapting and using um, these great strategies in your context. Um, so thank you so much, Irene, for that question. And thanks for answering, Spencer. Let's continue. All right, well, we're going to look at another lesson idea. <laughs> In this lesson idea, um, what, what the students uh, want to uh, come away with is an understanding of the difference between using present perfect to talk about uh, experiences and past simple uh, to talk about something that happened at a specific time and how those can be combined but also the difference between them. So I decided on a topic that I want to use to introduce the language. And the topic is uh, unique life experiences, or more specifically, world travel. And I've put up this picture of a map here. Um, before I share this full plan, I want to ask the participants for some ideas. Uh, in the previous lesson with There Is and There Are, we introduce the topic by reviewing vocabulary. So the question is, what's another way that we could introduce this a topic? Let's say Wonderful. a topic Great of- Great question. Uh, yeah, of world travel or, or maybe travel in general, even if um, students have only been to sure. a few places. Yeah, so what, sure. um, what could we, what, what other ways could we explore the topic? In the there is, there are lesson, we had students sort of think about their own context, look at pictures, brainstorm. What's another way that this topic, that a topic could be introduced or that we could explore? Great ideas already coming through. We have a lot of people saying visuals and pictures, um, showing travel pictures, that's a great idea. Maybe some flashcards, um, showing pictures, maybe playing um, have you ever, have you ever been to Maybe talking about their experiences, watching videos about travel, um, reading a passage and highlighting the specific tense um, that maybe it's on the topic of um, travel, um, giving pictures or a scenario to students. Really great ideas, everyone. Wonderful. Great. Can I just pick up one last comment that I see yeah. here? Telling them about Marco Polo mm -hmm. that as a history fan I would love to uh, start a story history story in my class yeah great um, idea well thank you for all of those ideas the the idea that I have in mind is similar to the one about um, looking at a text or look, looking at a passage so it could be a traditional text like an article or I'm thinking of since it's uh, about world travel or travel I'm thinking of how about an interview a text of an interview with someone who's a world traveler. Sounds good. So here's just a simple text and I imagine it would be longer than this, but we've made it short to put it up on the slide here. It's a text conversation between a journalist and a world traveler, Anne. So at first, um, the students can read through it. The teacher can read it with them. They might have some students come up as volunteers to act it out. Um, but they're just thinking about the ideas. They're not thinking about the language. And that's the point is entering into the topic without the language focus. But after they've entered into that topic, they can use this text as someone commented to explore the language. Um, <clears throat> At that point, students would analyze this dialogue to find examples of the present perfect and the past simple. So they could find examples of positive, negative, question forms, and then the teacher would ask them, what time are we talking about? Is it a specified time specifically? Anne says, 
I swam with crocodiles in Botswana two years ago. So we're trying to get the students to identify um, specific event with specific time using past simple, but present perfect with these different forms for, uh, we've also got a negative form. She says, I haven't ridden on the Trans-Siberian Railway. I've never seen the statues on Easter Island. So it starts with a topic, but then it goes into this language focus. In the output part of the lesson, I imagine that students would first work individually to think of some unique experiences that they have. Then they'd work together in a group of three or four to compare uh, and find out which unique experience they have is so unique that no one else has had the same experience. And then there's kind of a fun way to interact with the whole class. That group of three or four students can come up in front. Um, let's give an example. For example, uh, one of the three members of the group has swum, swum with dolphins. So at this point, all three group members take turns claiming that they are the ones who had this unique experience. I've swum with dolphins. I've swum with dolphins. I've swum with dolphins. Everyone makes the same claim. And other class members try to test the claims by asking them past simple questions, like, how old were you when you swam with dolphins? Where did you swim with dolphins? And of course, because only one person has really had this experience, the other ones have to think quickly and come up with an answer that's convincing and also not break character and show <laughs> that they're not the one. Mm -hmm. And then the students get to vote on who they think it really is who had that unique experience. Wow, so, that, sounds, that sounds really fun too. And having that little um, secret where the students are trying to figure out um, something I think really creates a meaningful and engaging activity. Sounds really fun. Well, I like it because I feel it goes back to that kind of personal expression. You have something that you want to share about yourself and the other students want to see if they can judge a book by its cover, if they can figure out who it was who had that experience. So that was our second lesson. Let's uh, give a, a quick recap of that lesson. And we're going back to our framework. The meaning focus input came from the original dialogue with the world traveler. Then, the students analyzed the dialogue, and that was the focus on language. Uh, the first output part was when they personalized it and wrote about their unique experiences. And finally, they made their claims in front of the class and the class had to kind of test those claims with true or imagined stories. And that was this fluency part of the lesson to be creative. Sounds great. Yeah. And we have, let's see, a couple of nice comments. Janek Paredes says, good way to have students use their own unique experience. Everybody likes sharing their personal experiences. Um, and one quick question about the interview part from PC. Did you show the dialogue directly or how did you show the dialogue? Did you give a, the students a copy of it or? There's some different ways that you could do it. If you think that they're uh, strong enough to just hear it, you could have it read first, um, but I would definitely give them a copy before they have to analyze it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if they're uh, weaker and need a little support, then I would just give them the dialogue from the beginning, even though we want to read through it first. Sounds good. Thanks. Well, uh, moving through the agenda for this presentation, we've looked at the importance of balancing input and output. And now we've thought about how input and output could uh, fit into a lesson plan. So we want to talk about one more thing 
here in our list of topics and that's what are some other activities that we could use to give students more of a chance to produce to have this output and how can we support them so that they can express themselves because as many of our participants said it's that personalizing and expressing their own ideas and sharing about themselves that we really want to give them a chance to do sounds good so the the main uh, principle here for choosing activities and thinking about what activities we can use is that we want activities where students are able to think to produce or to communicate why do we want them to think well, we want them to think because that's analyzing the world around them, understanding the world around them, and everyone has a different way, a different take on, on what they see and, and what the world is. So that's part of this uh, personalizing and individualization. Thinking could be as simple as considering a topic or analyzing the language to understand why it's being used, but they'll be able to explain it in a different way from someone else. So it's personal. Thinking is personal. Why would we want students to produce something? We want them to, to produce some things to express themselves creatively. This is kind of the theme of what we've been talking about for output. And it generally helps students to remember better what's been covered. If they don't respond, they don't have this output, it's just like somebody talking at you the whole time. And of course, uh, to communicate is giving students this chance of using their productive skills, learning about their friends, using the language. So a few yeah, activity and, ideas. And Helen T says, these are all ways to internalize the input, which I think is a great point. Great, definitely. Um, so the first activity idea I want to talk about is developing this idea again of building a topic or entering into a topic. Connecting with this last comment from Helen T is um, internalize the input. Like we can even set students up to remember it better before the input happens. Um, so any of these activities are still helping students to have that takeaway, the thing that they remember from the lesson. Um, in this case, it's by exploring the topic. One of the ways, and we mentioned it a bit in the first lesson plan with there is and there are. But one of the ways uh, to enter a topic is by brainstorming. So let's imagine um, connected to that world travel lesson again. Um, the teacher doesn't have to explain it or introduce the topic themselves. They can get students to think about it. Maybe students are working in teams and the, the teacher says, uh, with, your, with your team, think about three experiences that a world uh, traveler might have, a famous world traveler. And they so have someone to who's creative. really, yeah, someone who's really done a lot of traveling or something like that, who's really had lots of opportunities, what are some things that they might have done? Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, it doesn't matter if the students themselves have that experience because they're just in their mind entering this world of this other person, this mm -hmm. world traveler. Mm -hmm. um, there's different ways that you can do this. If, if the class enjoys competition, it could be um, who's the fastest to think of the ideas and you give them a point or who can think of ideas that no one else can think of and you give the team a point for a different idea. Um, or it can just be to share the ideas and think about the ideas. Let's say that the students think of some ideas of things that a world famous traveler has done. Um, at that point, they might not be using the language correctly that the teacher wants them to use, but the teacher can formulate it in the way that they want they want it to be modeled um we're thinking of this world famous traveler maybe it's Anne, like from our dialogue but mm -hmm. the students don't know Anne. <laughs> she's yeah. hiked in the himalayas she's cruised on the nile she's toured europe so when the teacher moves into the language focus part of the lesson they 
provide these model sentences. She has visited Europe many times for general experience. She went to France in these specific years, past simple. Great. Another way that uh, brainstorming could be used would be after they read the dialogue. So here I'm thinking instead of the dialogue, but they could still get the dialogue and then think of more things that they think she's done. Great. So and, this is sort of um, an extension of that original activity that you gave us. So maybe they've already um, gone through that, um, the dialogue that you shared with us before, and they've done that first activity. And this is another activity that would extend um, their output even more. It could be. Mm -hmm. It could replace it to just enter the topic, or it could be to further enter into the topic and think about it more. Gotcha. The point is we want them to be creative. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I want to talk about another activity for focusing on language. In our sample lessons before, we, we had two ways to focus on language. In the There Is There Are lesson, the teacher modeled the language. And in the past uh, simple present perfect lesson, the students found examples in a text. Mm -hmm. I want to ask our participants what they think. How else, what's another way that we could have students focus on language? Great. Besides, Great. So, besides yeah. modeling and besides the text analysis. So what are some other ways that we could have our students focus on language? So we saw those two great examples from lesson one with there is, there are, and lesson two with pre uh, presence, present perfect and past simple. Um, but what are some other ways that we could have our students focus on the language? Explain explicitly from Helen. Um, carefully design communication activities. Raja G says through models and presentations. Um, let's see, maybe by listening to their peers. Um, maybe reading with comprehension questions, using a graphic organizer from Sarkeda. Um, through games from Ma Elena. Um, great, wonderful ideas, everyone. What do you think, Spencer? Uh, some great ideas there. The one uh, idea that I do want to share more about is games. So we, we got someone who uh, came up with what I'm thinking about. <laughs> um, let's give one example of a game. Uh, I'm calling this language focus through competition. So instead of the teacher just giving all the rules, maybe they've looked at the dialogue already and they're making sure that they understand those rules. In this game, um, this game is often called something like grammar gamble. So in this game, you might have students in different teams. I'm imagining there's a red team, blue team, and orange team. At first, each team gets 100 points. Then we show them a sentence and they have to secretly find the error in the sentence with their team. Don't tell the other groups. So let's imagine there's a sentence on the board. Maybe it says, I have ever visited the Taj Mahal in India. And this is relating to our present perfect lesson again. Each team has 100 points. So then after they think they find the answer, they've got some idea of what the mistake is here. Then they decide if they're confident that they found the right mistake. If they're confident, they can offer a large number. Oh. If not, they mm -hmm. can offer a small number. So in this case, let's imagine the red team is very confident they found the mistake and the blue team and the orange team are less confident. Red team says 25 and blue team says 10. Orange team just says uh, five. They're not really sure mm -hmm. about it. And then finally, if they found the mistake, what's the mistake here, Kate? I have ever visited the Taj Mahal? Well, that word ever, I guess, right? You should either say I have never or take that word out if they actually have visited it, depending on what sure. they are. Mm -hmm. Sure, we don't want to use ever in a positive sentence. Mm -hmm. um, let's say they found, uh, some of them found the right mistake and some of them didn't. And then if they found it, 
it's added to their score. If they didn't, it's taken away. So it's kind of a fun thing because you never quite know how it's going to turn out. Um, in this case, orange team wasn't sure, but they got it right. And blue team got it wrong. That so. is a really fun game. Thanks for sharing that with us. I think I'm seeing a lot of people in the comments saying what a great idea that was. Um, one thing. Oh, one quick question from Irene. What's the maximum score? When do they win? <laughs> uh, they, <laughs> you can play it that way if you like. You can play it where achieving the score is how you win. But then if they get it, if they get it wrong too many times, you'll never achieve the score. Oh, I yeah, usually play where um, we have a certain number of sentences. Maybe mm -hmm. it's eight sentences or something. Mm -hmm. And then when the sentences are up, Whoever has the highest is the winner. Got it. Sounds fun. Just one uh, quick point to make there is if you encourage your students to discuss the mistake in English, oh, I think it's ever. Why do you think it's ever? Well, I think the teacher said that we're not supposed to use ever. You know, it's just another opportunity they have to use English uh, naturally um, in trying to, you know, achieve this goal of winning the game. Sounds good. I want to just say we have about four minutes to go. I want to make sure we get to all of your great activities. All right. Well, uh, the next activity I'm sure most of our participants are familiar with. It's a role play activity. And I'm thinking of that present perfect lesson again. So maybe the role play is about an interview between an employer and an employee. There's lots of opportunity there for a present perfect past simple questions. Have you ever worked in this field before? When did you work in this field before? Um, so the question for participants here is um, about how they can support learners in, um, in doing this role play. But uh, for the sake of time, sorry about that, uh, mm -hmm. we've given the answers here. Uh, some learners need this support of having time to brainstorm, thinking about what they're gonna say in this role play, thinking about what they'll talk about, thinking about what usually comes up in a, a, a interview with a job, a job interview, or we're putting the grammar explicitly on the screen. So that's a great way because um, students have the freedom to say whatever they wanna say, but um, they have a reason to use the language we've been practicing in class. Mm -hmm. And the last two activities, one is this kind of mingle where you move around the room and try to find someone who fits with a question that we have. Let's say we're doing this present perfect lesson again. Um, so find someone who has a certain experience. They've swum in the ocean maybe, or they have done, they've never traveled abroad. So they're moving around trying to find someone who fits with this um, particular experience. If we want to make it harder for the students, they can uh, ask a follow-up question. Maybe it's a past simple, or um, they might make the questions themselves, these original questions. It's a great way to uh, have the students interacting. Yeah, sounds sorry fun. About the, sorry about the short time there, but no, our that's last- okay. Our last activity is uh, similar to this, except there's only one, one question. Students have one question, one card. They have to move around and talk to as many people as possible. Still with the present perfect theme, the question might be, have you ever eaten something unusual? So again, we're just trying to get that opportunity for students to uh, interact using the language that we've practiced in class, letting them practice it first by speaking and really learning something new about other people in class. Um, Wonderful. There are so many, these are all such great ideas. And I think based on the comments today, I think a lot of people will be using some of these ideas in their classrooms this coming week. But I think, um, that's great. yeah, what I think is so great is there are so many ways that we can provide opportunities for our students to be creative and um, really use the language in a meaningful way. And you've just shown us um, how we can be creative in doing that as well. So thanks so much. Well, I hope that what people take away besides any particular activity idea is just this sense that we need this balance. Balance between 
input for what these rules are and also output where they can be creative, they can share their ideas, they can use the language. And I hope that this conversation will be continued where people will um, share with us how they use the ideas and uh, what they're going to do from to, to balance their own classes. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Spencer, for that really great presentation. Thanks so much. Um, I, think we, I think we all have learned a lot about really balancing input and output in our grammar instruction. And I can tell that so many people in our comments and in our chats are really excited about this presentation and really enjoyed it and will be able to use it, the principles and the ideas and activities in their classroom very soon. So thanks so much. And thanks also, of course, to our wonderful audience. Um,